I kept on going But I saw all pretends And I lost any idea of coming home Because I don't know But I surely need to roam <laughs> Great entrance to the seduction show, uh, episode six. And today we have a very special guest from uh, the United States. I'm in Medellin still. Uh, Steve Mayeda is here, back visiting. And uh, for who doesn't know Steve, he, uh, we've been colleagues for over a decade and we're becoming closer and closer friends. And uh, we spent some time again this year in uh, April in Austin, and he's now here in Medellin. And I thought that he would be the excellent first uh, guy in this series of interviews where I um, kind of come out of my bubble and look outside and to talk to men that inspire me, that I would like to learn more from, that I would like to become better friends with. And the goal with this series is that I deeply listen and I try to understand what kind of talents, capabilities the man has and, and offers to humanity, uh, what kind of talents and what kind of man also um, uh, I can refer to, uh, to him. So he uh, uh, can do his work and help guys out become greater men. <laughs> so this is the first one of that series. And I'm very excited to have Steve here. He's sitting in front of me, actually. We're sitting here in Medellin, Woo! Colombia. So, uh, what are you? <laughs> <coughs> with an A, with an A, with an O. <laughs> so welcome, Steve. What's up? <laughs> Man, for somebody that's listening, that was a long intro. <laughs> so if you don't know, Hans and I make fun of each other. Probably I do it too much. Hans, you actually don't make, well, you're bad at making. You're too nice. <laughs> but I saw Michael Sky kind of busting on you when I came out. I actually got a very good training in that because I was raised, well, a big part of my youth was in, in Brussels. And there you have a lot of Italians, a lot of Spanish. And in the oh, Latin, yeah. Latin culture, like getting at your mom is, is yeah. a, a given. Yeah. But it, it was new to me then. I'm like, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Why, why did somebody say, why would you say this about somebody? Well, name? I'm not offended. It just didn't register. Yeah. You know, it's not a... Yeah. It still doesn't really register. Yeah, you should. Uh, if you got training, you should get your money back. So. <laughs> That's how Americans do it, right? So it's, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, no, man. No, it's good to be here. You, you have been many people. So let me just tell you, <clears throat> over 10 years ago, easily that, my friends came to, they got, JetBlue had this thing where you could travel everywhere. And they did it like that goes, okay. We're, there's, there's an airflow going on in here. If you guys can't imagine, we have like a brothel where there's <laughs> women massaging their feet and there was a door open and I thought it was going to shut. <laughs> God, Francesca, just keep this. Way. Okay, anyway, but um, <clears throat> if she massages me better, I'll be a better interviewer. So anyway, but um, no, uh, my friends got these, these like jet blue passes. I forget what it was. It was like 500 bucks for a year. You go like anywhere for, mm. I think it was less than that. I think it was like 200 bucks. You go anywhere in the world for a jet blue went and they came to Columbia. And I remember seeing, this is pretty nuts. Yes. I saw uh, an image in a place where now I've been, but in Montserrat and Bogota. And they, they have, uh, you good? You go good? ahead. Yes. Okay. Well, I just, uh, you know. I'm, I'm checking the, oh, wait, is that on? This, the sound here. We can always take it out. Let's, I, I want your, expert opinion so we got this yeah, yeah. and you got to talk as yeah. well so yeah you got no, this, I'm talking. Yeah. and you got this yeah. and that's probably better yes yeah but then you have this too which is too no, 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 too much yeah. Huh? yeah yeah you want the it was that's good continue yeah. yeah 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 you talk i talk okay so, so it, we're, i think we need to be closer for that what's the reading on it what do you mean reading it's it says green so it's going good <laughs> So if the audio sucks now, <laughs> I can hear it. Go just ahead. Just my luck. Uh -huh. No, this sounds fine. The, uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll sit a little bit closer. Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah. One, two, three, four. And then Anna was going to 
uh, here in prison. So um, <laughs> anyway, the the my friends got these passes going uh, all over. It was uh, Darren Fujiyama and Nick Quick. And they took a picture of them at like Montserrat, you know, it's like overlook of the city, which I didn't go. I didn't know what it was until recently. It was all cloudy the day that I went. But I took one of the best photographs I've ever taken. Best. Um, I'll show you a picture of it. Anyway, so um, I was like, man, this is crazy. That was the first time I started hearing about Colombia. And then Nick lived here. He lived in Medellin and lived out of a van and would talk about it. He'd be like, Steve, what are you doing? What are you doing, man? Like, why are you there? And so this was 10 years ago. And so now I have like a huge network of worldly friends. And I traveled around the world, so on, got hitched, and then settled down in Austin. But then I, uh, I traveled around the world, but I never made it to Colombia. And I always thought about it. And so then, as soon as I could travel again, I was like, I'm going there. So uh, the thing is, is then in that time, so many people I know, so many people I know came here and just mm. wrote about it, talked to me about it, like saying it was so amazing. And then uh, my friend, uh, my friend Jim, not the same Jim we know, he was saying, he's like, man, Colombia is going to turn into Costa Rica because all mm. these Americans are coming there or people with money right. and they're going to drive the prices up and make the culture different. And don't get me wrong. I like Costa Rica as well, but um, it's different. You know, it's more, Costa Rica is just a little bit less expensive than the U S right. um, and there's so many great things about it. Um, and Colombia is very inexpensive. And, and the worst part about this, the worst part is, is on the plane right over, there was some like American dude behind me talking to another guy, the Cuban dude that spoke fluent English. And he was just like, yeah, man, dude, I get to live like a king. I'm 22 years old. I'm just going to have investment properties. I'm going to like, I'm going to win, man. I'm, I'm like the best. This is what it's about. Like, oh, and the women, they're just like, just, you know, it's like Kleenex. Or, he wasn't saying that, but he was just like such a fucking asshole. Right. And I'm just like, oh no. <laughs> because, you know, we come here for, <clears throat> we come to a lot of places because I suppose we can, and you want to come to a place where you can experience good things. Mm -hmm. But if you're not a part of the people, it's really sad. Right. In fact, I'll say this. The, I was at a dinner, um, a really cool dinner. Um, if I need to back away, I, can, I was just sitting closer. because. Um, so I was at this dinner in Prague with my friend that's a porn star, and it was his birthday, and he invited all these expats to come, people that lived from all over the world but were now living in Prague. And it was crazy because they were all non-porn people. Although, actually, one was. And it was so funny. He was like, guess what? You know, like... Uh, Dirty taxi drivers number four now in the world. And I'm like, man, say the word, I'll get that thing to number three, number two. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, they were all like people who had like, you know, investing and just families. It was a very interesting discussion. But one of the things that they were saying is like Prague is such a great city and they're you know, like, you should move here. And they said, man, but I hate the type of person. Because I was asking the difference of what makes a disrespectful person and the person that is respectful. And um, they were like, the number one thing is learning the language, right. and not expecting that people serve yeah. your culture, you're a part of their culture. And I think that that's so important in it um, because <clears throat> whatever it is that is offering you something, whether it's economy or uh, romantic endeavors or uh, just even if you're going around seeing things, the culture made that, the culture right. built that. And you have to see where that's coming from. And even in an economic standpoint, not that I am an expert in this, but to, to see how that is serving you and how and where it came from and to mm. understand it and to understand perhaps the struggles that came with it. If you don't, it's, it's really terrible. Like when we were talking earlier about how different people have relationships in Colombia, you got to know that because right. if you don't, you know, you're, you're kind of, in the wrong, you're on the wrong field, playing the wrong game, you know? So it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. So to see people and experience is so important. Mm -hmm. and I, I get that I'm American. I act very American. In America, I don't act American, but traveling. <laughs> you notice that you are. Well, yeah, you notice you are. <laughs> so all the Americans listen to me like, what do you mean that? In America, I'm like just some guy, right? But traveling around, it's like, oh yeah. <laughs> He's like carefree, loud. It's like walk somewhere and doesn't look, you know, I just, right. uh, those types of things. It's, it's very, it's very clear. So nice. Anyway. A good introduction to Medellin. Yes. To me, it's also kind of like, it's a little paradise. You know? 
It's amazing. It, it, I've only seen very little. Yeah. And dude, this is, so what I tell people about Costa Rica is it's, there's areas that are a lot like Hawaii, but Hawaii is very expensive. Mm. So Costa Rica is very inexpensive compared to Hawaii. It's just a little bit less expensive compared to the U.S. in general. But it's got everything that Hawaii's got. And it's got snakes, yeah. venomous snakes. Too. <laughs> and, but it's, it's clean and it's safe. And I would argue that in some ways it's cleaner and safer than Hawaii. And of course, in other ways, it, can, it may not be. But like right. I took pictures all around San Jose at night. And I know people that have been robbed there. But I felt very safe. And I, I went with a group of people, so it was a little bit easier. But man, yeah, I think, but, I think Medellin is very similar to uh -huh. that field, but there's no beach. Right, mountains around. Um, Medellin is a star, but let's talk about someone else today. I want to know more about you. <laughs> okay. And uh, I would love to know, well, let's start with this. I would love to know what you're, what you're currently working on. What are you... So I'm currently working on a lot of stuff that has to do with divorce and everything that comes around that. Sadly, there's not a lot of good stuff around that, mainly because I've been going through that and I was like to uh, the kind fucking, uh, God, man, why does he have so Reem. Reem. I, I hate saying that. Every time I say that name, I'm like, <laughs> I think of, in Tropic of Cancer, Henry Miller is talking about. Henry One Miller. letter away from a bad job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, The, I was talking to him and I was like, he was like, this could be harmful for your career. I'm like, well, no shit. But I mean, that's like, that's not the point of being married or getting a divorce. But um, <clears throat> I'm like, what are you I, saying? You, 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 well, for people who don't know you, you just went through a divorce. Going saying. through. So going through. The, uh, um, I was like, man, I don't have any other option. Like, what am I going to, I don't get the people that don't share their personal lives. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense to me. And I literally don't have another option because I can't, um, I can definitely lie, but I can't lie as a persona or as an essence mm -hmm. of me. And I give so much to myself in my work that, that ties in. But in my work, you know, I've had men's groups since 2007, nonstop. And uh, like Reem was saying, that's the thing now. I'm like, dude, I've always been doing that. So these big communities, so you see guys go through divorces and mm -hmm. a lot of the same things happen to me. Right. It was good to see like that process in it. So a lot of that is going there. There's a lot towards addiction and there's a lot that we're going to start moving towards like finding yourself as a man from like a mid twenties, mid thirties kind of angle. So uh -huh. there's uh those are the, Those are the markets that we're hiring all the snakes in the world. What to. you said, so if, if the topic of the, say, divorce, if the topics of uh, addiction um, are assuming that they're clear. They're very different. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's almost like uh, breaking with addiction. But, uh, but the, third thing, the third thing you said was young men mm -hmm. helping them find their way. How does that look? What is that? So in coaching men, you see just a lot of patterns of people. There's many patterns, but we are just picking these ones from a marketing standpoint and from a content standpoint. And what I mean by marketing, I could go all into this, but I coach. I don't like worry about uh, what can sell. So what we do is people who I trust, which is like three people in the whole world, look at whatever I'm planning to do. And, and find markets within that. So one of those is like younger men that, that are mid 20s, it could be early 20s, moving to early 30s or mid 30s, I'm sorry. And what that means is, <clears throat> is guys that are wondering all those questions. Like what is the experience of being a man? How do I assert myself? How do I be alpha or whatever? And I kind of hate that word. Um, I like, how do I have a relationship? How do I fulfill the sexual experiences? How do I make money? How do I, get these things. And I think culture teaches those all wrong. And I get that there's like a cultural movement saying that culture teaches that all wrong. So we should all be alphas. And, um, you know, that's the same thing that pickup was sold. It was like, we watched everybody loves Raymond and we had this and that there's nothing enforcing or empowering men. And, uh, you know, there's, there's also a lot of angry men out there and there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, people that are, are lost in that sense. And how this actually ties into addiction is addiction is 100% shaped by our culture and society. And it mixes with traits of our genetics and so on. 
the reason why I say it's 100% is because we wouldn't have addiction problems if we didn't have societal problems, if we didn't mm. have an overly dense society, and, and if we didn't have all these things. But we do, and I'm not complaining about that. We're not going to change it. We're not mm-hmm. going to, like the way you cure some or whatever, the way you deal with somebody who's on heroin is not by watching TED Talks about giving them a hug or about understanding that addiction is the opposite of connection. There's, there's a lot that goes into it. Mm -hmm. And the way you keep somebody on heroin is arguing about what society did and didn't do. And if you work with people on heroin, you watch people die. In fact, I was asking, like, Reem was talking to me about stuff. And we didn't talk about this too much, and, but I got the take. Because he was asking, like, what I do. I said, well, half the money I make is off of addiction. And uh, we were talking about people who have hepatitis. And I said, man, if you watch somebody die who has hepatitis C, it's way worse than watching somebody die with HIV into AIDS, which is a horrible thing to watch. And you're just like, how do you do that? And I didn't really get into it, but I've seen people die off of that. I've seen people mm. kill themselves off of that. I know somebody once a week who dies from some drug related thing, whether it's suicide or overdosing um, or even murder for that matter. Mm. I mean, it's just the, the, the drug world is so fucked up. You, it's creatively awesome in the sense that it's a force that is beyond anything we can comprehend. Mm. <clears throat> so in a, in a sad way, I mean, I haven't experienced as much as nearly as much as my friends, but you see this, you know, or you see just chaos. Um, you see people that have just been through insane things as a way of life, mm. you know? Um, and it's, it's amazing. And it's also sad and heartbreaking, whatever. But what the saddest part of that is, is when they, just the solitude and isolation that comes from that. So you take that in the drug world, we have an immediate problem. We have an immediate mm. thing that needs to change. And then once that changes, there's a whole bunch of changes that can happen. So the immediate problem is the addiction. They can't stop using, they're living like an animal. And it's not like, I mean, for people that don't know, it's, it's pretty bad. And you shouldn't feel sorry. I'm not asking for that. You should definitely not, you know. Um, you shouldn't just say like, get a job because it's like really hard. Um, and then also like, you know, a lot of mental illnesses are caused by a situation. So it's usually, there could be a chemical imbalance leaning in the brain or whatever. And I'm not a doctor, but I just work with so many people. Like mm. They know the real answer to this. Or maybe they'd get it wrong. But the there might be a chemical leaning, you know. But the situation will either uh, empower that more or aggravate it. Or the situation may create something. Mm. So... Again, I'm not an expert, but if you take something like bipolar, that's a chemical imbalance. You take something like borderline personality disorder, that's generally a social, it's something that is developed. Mm. Um, they're both really not good <laughs> if somebody has untreated. Um, and there, you'll see craziness in that. You mix addiction with that, you'll see some really crazy shit. With it. So in that, we have this immediate problem, like the person needs to stop, right? Then the solution is they do stop. Okay? And then after that, like I said, it opens up to this weird world. Of the Are you help them stop? Can, yeah, yeah. I mean, so certain situations in particular to that, but... um, What kind of addictions are we talking about? We're talking about drugs? I mainly deal with heroin addicts and, uh, you know, there's some meth and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So to me, addiction is addiction. But the getting clean, the process of helping them stop is, can change dependent upon the type of drug and the situation. So like Mm -hmm. a lot of times people will do, um, they'll go to Costa Rica or... Mexico or Belize or wherever, and they do Ibogaine or Aboga, um, which I didn't know for a long time, but very different. But um, they'll do that to help with the detox process. And then there's this myth with all these dickheads who are like, if you just do Ibogaine, you cure him. You don't cure. The, I know that in, from what I see, the same percentage of people die who've done Ibogaine and attempted to get clean off of that is people who do it either using methadone, suboxone, or cold turkey. It's, it's a tough, it's, you, mm. if you're working in the heroin game, you know a lot of people who die. So, but let, let's go back to this analogy. So they have a problem, they stop, that's the way they stop. And then once they stop, they stop using, they go to this, uh, they can have a lot of different ways that they stop using. So they could do a 12-step program, they could do therapy, they could get into spirituality, they could do all sorts of stuff, right? To, to help with that, that mm-hmm. can work, but they have to be very dedicated and a lot of work and then life can be good. Okay. So um, when we get to the man woman problems, we don't have consequences that are 
death. We have consequences that are divorce. We have consequences that are um, embarrassment. We have consequences that are not as bad. Loneliness. Loneliness. They're bad, but they, they're the slow burn and the slow kill. And so we have this society that's causing all these problems, like addiction, like men feeling disempowered. But men feeling disempowered are saying, well, clearly we can do the math. We can see this. It's like you, uh, you see we grew up watching these horrible movies. That Then there were movies that showed a woman superhero, like Captain America took my dick away, like I no longer had a way to be a man. Like this is, this is terrible. This is my fight. This is why I got divorced. This is why I got embarrassed. This is why I got rejected. So we have a huge movement of men looking at all of that stuff. And, and that women are being empowered, like women, giving women jobs of power. Like this is, like, we can do the math. This doesn't work. So we see these guys just going crazy with that stuff. And you can find, you can find the truth in there. You can always find that truth. But if you get to the experience of that truth, like in seduction and living a good life and so on, you almost don't meet people that live that way. What's tricky in our industry of dating is there's a lot of people who never really got that of what it was like to one. There was a couple phases because they so, never really got what. Well, we'll get to. It. So they never got to what they were looking for fulfillment. So there were guys that didn't get to sleep with women. That's most of them. Uh -huh. And then like I'm talking about instructors, the the people broadcasting the message. We'll get to the people who were customers. But um, so people who were broadcasting the message, most of them weren't actually good at getting women. Then there were the people that, the, the low percentage, it's like 10, 15, 20% that did get good at meeting women, but they made it like a game, they made it a power move, whatever. And then you never hear them talking about sex. So way back when, probably when I first met you in 2007, a friend of mine, <clears throat> this was actually in 2009, I think he told me this. But anyway, he said, uh, he was like, man, you hear these guys like making these lay reports. And it's like this long thing of like what I said. And then this is what I did. And this is how I turned the tables. This is how I got that. And then we fucked. And nobody's talking about the, the sex part and how that changed them and how that made them. And I was like, man, it's so crazy. And then I knew these guys were really good at vetting women. And they, they didn't have, uh, they didn't like it. They never talked about like, oh, man, I really like this girl. They're like, yeah, she's got big boobs or she does this or she's weird. I can't talk to her. Yeah, I'm going to keep fucking for a little bit. Yeah, I'm not. So there, but there's never an experience of what it was mm. to be with a woman. And then there was one guy I knew who was into that. He was like, oh, man, it's so great. And he was talking about how great it was from the meeting, from what you said, from how you turned the table, from how you left, from how you pulled, from how you had sex, from how. And then it continued. It was like, and then her hair. And then it was like, man, she did this dance for me. Mm -hmm. And then like, I laid down the law with her. And then she laid down the law with me. And then it was like, it was like this, this amazing experience. Even if it was a casual sexual experience, he always spoke of it like, like it, like it was this gift that he was given. He was given a part of a gift and an experience that human beings could do. And it was so amazing. And myself, so why I deal with addicts is I am one, had I died of an overdose. And had two overdoses. Some of my friends have had like, like over 20. It's like crazy, man. <laughs> Those are the best stories. One of my friends, she, dude, she told me one of the best stories. Oh, man. She, she saved my life, like, when I went through the divorce thing. But anyway, the, um, the, I, I was like, man, there's such a beautiful experience. And so I was like, I want to get in that. Just space. hearing that from that guy. Yeah, well, so I had always thought this. This is a crazy thing. You're in one of the elite companies of PUA, and nobody talks about this. You have 12 people every other weekend hiring you, and none of them talk about it, mainly because they were students. But you're with coaches from all around the world. Mm. Nobody's talking about it. No, but you go on the boards where thousands of people are talking about it. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody's talking about the seduction part. You get a guy like, let's say, David Shade, who's like the sex master, not talking about it. Mm. You know, it's all about how do I gain the power? How do I mm. gain the, in there, in, within seduction, there's power, there's control, there's, uh, there could be lying, cheating, there could be deception, there could be manip manipulation, but there's overall a sharing in an entire experience that goes throughout it. 
Mm -hmm. To choose one of the subcategories of that is wrong. You know, and so that's what we're doing with culture. Like looking at that. It's even sadder because like, so those are the instructors. Like, none are Are you saying they're, they're not, not looking at, say, the seduction, the poetic part, the... Uh, that's not even on the map. <laughs> Like all these people the you're interviewing, parts. that's like a foreign language. That that's a foreign language they don't want to speak. That's uh -huh. like uh, I met a dude in in uh, Budapest, and I said, "Well, why don't you learn Hungarian?" He's like, "What's the point?" <laughs> but just because the the uh, nobody speaks that, you know, and like not not a permanent fixture there right. around the world, it's not as useful as like Mandarin or English or something. So, but um, it's would, telling. It's telling that I'm just having this thought that. As you could see with anything in our culture, you just look at architecture when before uh, beauty was one of the pillars, you mm -hmm. know, you made things partly just because they were beautiful. So they had uh, buildings, had ornaments for no other reason than it looks beautiful. And, and with time, you've seen that completely disappear. And our, our, I still believe very strong we have that desire for beauty, but we're looking for it less. You know, you see it in architecture and you see it in this too, when we're... And the great things have come from pickup, you know, but you see it's a very left brain, masculine, yeah, yeah, yeah. step by step, yeah. utilitarian, functional kind of description of it all. You know? Yeah. And there's something else there, which you're alluding to, the more poetic, seductive, artistic part. You know? But even in that, when you get into art, so I don't believe people were doing it just for beauty. They were doing it because they felt they experienced something that they could not articulate. Mm -hmm. It was of a, perhaps a higher power yes. or whatever. And in that you you tried to manufacture a window towards that and then all of a sudden it turns into you know whatever michelangelo did in the sistine chapel like there was so much in that i believe as an artist that you want to communicate and then you develop your skill because you want to communicate this thing that's outside of language mm -hmm. and that is within a different language per se of uh just like man i want this i want this connection. I want people to understand this. So I, like myself, I was a light designer, did a lot in theater, filmmaking, shit like that. The, it was like, I wanted to communicate this thing. And then all of a sudden it turns into a story or whatever. And you build your skill set around that. Mm -hmm. Now, what's crazy is I think in art, if you lose touch and you only make it a skill, and you only make it something that is beautiful, you lose the meaning of beauty. So beauty is greater than us. Beauty is mm. something that we don't understand and can yes. never understand but want to pursue. And if we lose that idea and connection, then we turn it into something man-made. In essence, beauty is a man-made attempt yes. to try and understand something beyond man. Yes. Just like science. It's so an, illu an, an, an illusion, not illusion, but illusion to yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but there's a saying that we have uh, in TSL, which is my company, boom, is that uh, <laughs> nature doesn't need science, man needs science to understand nature. So science is a worship of the world, uh -huh. and it, it, it's done in a way that is very specific and very absolute. There's a process and a method, and it's great, but it can be wrong because, like truth, for instance, everybody else is the truth. Human beings have flourished without the truth and thinking the opposite of the truth, living in the lie. Whereas nature doesn't have a truth, it just has existence. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is coming from my syntax and whatever. But there, there is no like yes or no in nature. There is no this is it or isn't. Man's choice determines whether there is and isn't. So, mm -hmm. and, and then because our worth is so valued on connection, if I tell you something that isn't, because I can influence you with thought and language, then that's a lie and it's looked down upon. Mm -hmm. But we then, we look at like, like again, all of the shit with men being pissed off about society is like, is like it's a lie, we're, we're living a lie. We're living a choice and an expression of humanity, which mm -hmm. benefits us in so many ways. Like, for instance, I, the same culture that makes feminism be a cancer or whatever you want to see it as um, or whatever you blame the whole world on gives many benefits to me that I don't want to change. And uh, like what I see a lot of the guys who are talking about how alpha men need to be, they would never be alpha. <laughs> they were, they're like the, 
they're not they're not any of that but society allows them to have a, a presence of leadership and confidence what if it was about being bigger and stronger and taking risks and or whatever alpha is assumed to mean they're not it you know and so i think that that's um, mm. that's telling but go ahead how is this how is these these i want to draw it back into your work and how you like how you work with people how does how do these philosophical say considerations and thoughts how do they influence or direct what you're they make me to? waste a lot of people's time <laughs> <laughs> they make me talk and think i know something and so here's this thing i don't i'm more than willing to say i'm stupid and don't know shit but like because i'm i'm you know i'm i'm i was schooled in in philosophy so i have a, a I'm at least curious about that. Yeah. But when I when I visited you now several times and I saw you, uh, I saw you with your group, the Austin Man's Development. Yeah. And I saw you just gather, which was incredible, and really have guys share. Yeah. I also saw instantly a very deep, uh, profound care that you have, and really wanting to help each one of the guys. You know, and and uh, I ne I never saw this or I, way less, yeah. the, the philosophical considerations, you know, it's very... Oh, you didn't see my philosophical <laughs> It's very hands-on, you know, it's very like a, the, in the trenches. And uh, uh, I am in the trenches and I am a muse of philosophy now. <laughs> I mean, I like, look, dude, yeah, here's the thing, is like, um, with the philosophy, there is an extensive philosophy that ties into every single social dynamic I teach mm -hmm. as well as uh, whatever I do with addicts and stuff like that. There is a philosophy that goes into it. But mm -hmm. what is most important is man's experience because philosophy is always going to be wrong to some extent. It cannot, it cannot be a truth because it's man made. Right? So, um, so you got to take it with a grain of salt. But at the same time, it is your guide. Yes. So it's like you realize it can be wrong, but you, you, need it as a guide and you need it to follow right but with with me and my work um man no, i work with men and then like you, you say i'm hands-on but with with addiction you have to be and that is what i modeled my groups after like a lot of addiction stuff um is that you, you uh, have to be hands-on right and you have to care because i could sit there i'm writing this thing on divorce and i'm like i'm like look you so there's a couple things that i always say like you need a lawyer and people are like i can't afford one like, what do i do but you really should have a lawyer if you're going through a divorce. Um, if you don't, there's just so many ways it could go wrong. And I get there's stories where guys have benefited from, uh, you know, not having a lawyer, but I know probably 10 times or more than that, that have had tragedies happen mm -hmm. because of it. But also you need a men's group and you need some sort of mental health awareness or help. So with the men's group, it, it helps tremendously. It does not replace mental health nor does it replace a lawyer, which a lot of people think it can, but your lawyer isn't fighting your emotional battles. Mm -hmm. Your lawyer is not fighting. He's fighting a legal battle. That's it. He's not fighting right. you know, over your kids. He's not fighting over your money. He's fighting a legal battle to do, to communicate with the courts to do that. So and, how, how does that work? Your group, you have a weekly meeting or how is it? Yeah. 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 So, um, Anyway, why a men's group is important in context to a lawyer or a therapist is your therapist can't always be there for you, or a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a counselor, and your lawyer can't always be there for you. And you're going to have times where you're fucked up. Mm -hmm. So what are the outlets for that? So we have 24-hour support online, which gets it. You know, So if you have a problem and you post on the, the online group that you have a problem, somebody will call you. If you're in like Thailand or Malaysia, somebody will call you. Like You will get... Uh -huh. There's a guy on there now who's going through something. He's on the phone with everybody. It has to do with his work security, job security. He's, he's on the phone with a bunch of people. And he just texted me while I'm here. And he's like, dude, I can't believe so-and-so helped me out this much. So that, that's important because right. when you're stressed, you make bad decisions. If you do that in a divorce, because what's going to trigger you? You've never felt this experience before right. of what it's like to drop off your kids and your ex talk shit to you. You never experienced what it's like to go into court and have, a, and have the other party get all dramatic and you get dramatic and the judge tells you to shut up. Uh -huh. You've never had an experience where that happens into a consequence where you have to pay, let's say, $200, $300 more in child support, which ends up 
being forty or fifty thousand dollars in the long run when it could have been a lot less. You never have those experiences of knowing what that's like, mm. and so you need a group of people who have experienced it, who've lived better lives, and who have moved on from it, and who can manage it, either fix it, accept it, whatever, but live a good life. And if you don't have that, it's so easy to get caught up in the hate, the anger, to continue making bad decisions. To uh, like, let's say you do that. Like I make an analogy in this PDF that I'm working on is like the uh you drop off your kids and your ex is like kids be careful because you don't want to be hurt like last time or some something that like a, a woman might say not all but you know some um and i don't know the stats but one attorney was like about a third move into that like it's very common you know wow. but it's not 100 percent, you know and then you got to look at why they might say that it's like if you look at the red pill stuff it's like because women are supposed <laughs> to, to think evil things and but see, again, that goes back to addiction. We don't have addiction if we don't have stress from society. Right. We don't have women and men doing stupid stuff that we haven't seen in relationships before if we don't have pressures from society. Those pressures are not fucking a Wonder Woman movie. Those pressures are not uh, you know, people reading books on feminism. Those pressures are feeling, they're, they're the bigger problem of why somebody needs feminism or the red pill, of feeling alone, of not being a part of, of not understanding the value of human connection, of growing up in separation, mm. of growing up without all of these things. And in that, that, those are the things that we need to look at and either prepare to fix the problems they create uh -huh. or start changing those things. But campaigning whether or not, you know, Mad Max is feminist or, or toxic masculinity is the dumbest thing that we could do and it solves nothing. And mm -hmm. it just brings more awareness to a culture of angry people that right. somebody listens to too much. So that being said, your ex talks shit to you while you're dropping off the kids. You guys are pissed at each other. You're going to go through a phase where that happens. You're angry at each other, but you got to swap kids or maybe you don't, I don't know, but you, so you swap kids. She says something and you say something back. You say like, man, shut up. You're the whore that did that. Or something. You say something extreme, right? Say something inappropriate. And she's recording you. And then in the court, six months later, three months later, whenever, when you're feeling something totally different, that recording's played. Maybe it's just in front of a judge. Maybe it's in front of a jury. But that influences the, the, the opposing attorney's case, your ex-wife's attorney's case, to go like, look, he's unequipped. He made a poor decision. He couldn't handle communicating properly and he brought it in front of the kids. And he's trying to influence and manipulate them. And the crazy thing is, is that whole discussion that he's having isn't going to matter a year down the road or two years down the road with the kids, but it, well, it will, because it might influence the judge or the jury's opinion to, you know, add on a different alimony settlement, different uh, child support thing. And child support literally is really all math, but it, it could influence things to work against you and drastically hurt you. Mm. You know, two days, the difference between in Texas standard visitation and expanded standard visitation is a lot that adds up to years of time with your kids that is taken away. And if you could get expanded standard, get it. And you're, you're prevent, you're preparing guys for that with your group, for so example, with a guy if who, they're going through yeah. it, they connect them with guys who already went through it. So with a situation like that, when you're dropping off the kids or whatever, you're going to mess up. It's just, you're, when you're going through a divorce, you're dealing with inhuman things, things that you're unprepared to deal. Like you've mm -hmm. never felt these things before in your life. Right. So you're going through that you have to, one of the recommendations would be, all right, you know, you got the legal stuff taken care of, you got the, the therapy or whatever, um, and hopefully you can afford those things if you can't. You know, men's group is the, the most affordable, but in that, I would say get on the phone with somebody right before and right after. Mm -hmm. I can tell you a story, so the reason why I'm writing this, I actually got asked to, um, but in the publishing world, that doesn't really mean anything, still gotta write it. Then sell it to. Them. But I got asked because I have a situation where one of the worst things happened to me and with me and my older boys, which eventually got resolved, one of the worst, like is really tragic. It's not not a good thing. And then um in the latest saga, I handled it probably in the best way. So they were like, dude, this is a tremendous perspective. Like and you have notes. The other thing too is in the last thing I took notes week by week of mm. what was happening, which was 
kind of a profound thing, but in both situations where I handled it poorly, I reached out to my group for emotional support uh -huh. the first time and, uh, and I got it and I didn't really know how to navigate legally and those guys later didn't know or it was hard to communicate. The second one, I handled things legally, I felt in a good way. I handled them in terms of like, you know, any emotions that I was going through in a good way and then with my group in a good way. And uh, I just remember the first time that I was, I went all over the place in that, but in that I had guidance. And right. where I was kind of getting to in this is when I, so I didn't see my older kids for five years. So from three to five, and then all the way from, oh, wait a minute, let me do the math on this. I can't think. Anyway, but I didn't Couple see them years. for five years, right? So um, it was from three to, three to five, and then from 10 to uh, uh, eight. I did not have uh, an interaction with them. And it was just like, it was tragic. But I handled, there's so much I could say about that that was good and beneficial. Or, man, changed so much in my life. It allowed me to get into the other relationship. It allowed me to understand so much. Like, it was this huge tragedy had benefits. Right. But of course, it would have been better to get those benefits without having the tragedy. And in all of that, I remember when I was able to see them again. And what I did was I had everybody in my group available for me to call before. I talked to them all the way up to getting out of the car to see them again and hugging my kids for the first time. And, you know, doing, we went to an activity. It was pretty cool um, where we made uh, an at -lateral. So some of the spear an animal. So um, we, we did that. We talked, we uh, hung out. We went for a ride somewhere, went, went to go eat. And then as soon as I got out, there were people waiting for me to talk to them. In that whole experience, there's a lot which can be too emotional or what you right. might want to say. You don't know what to say. You're like, man, a very difficult thing for me in that was like, I want to influence these kids. You know, I'm the father. You know, my other kids, I'm like so influential in their lives. I'm right there. How do I do this? Mm. How do I take on that role? So immediately, I'm like trying to impose myself on them. You could, you know, delay some things or make some mistakes or make some big mistakes doing that too much. Um, yeah, another thing was like uh, one of them, one of my kids wasn't communicating with me that much. So I reached out to other guys in the group that it's my group, you know? And I'm like, right. Okay, my kid's not relating to me as much. How do I do this? And they just tell different ways that they do it. The thing was, yeah. is mm -hmm. some of those things that they said didn't necessarily work. They weren't the way that I ended up making communications with them. They were the ways that, that I was able to discharge a lot of my confusion right. and not react expression is dependent upon choice just like how we back to the philosophy nature doesn't have a truth or a lie lies and honesty and dishonesty is a man-made concept it's a way of man and ways of man are great but they're not ways of nature like you have to mm. make that distinct or in my philosophy when i teach guys at, at the upper levels you have to make that distinction because in order to get the value of choice, whether it's talking to your kids, whether it's seduction, whether it's whatever. I mean, and I can bring this back to seduction too. I can bring it back to so many things. You have to have expression. You cannot have force. So control mm. happens even in society where scarcity happens. You know, why did the, why did, uh, the USSR fall? You know, why did the Mayans fall? And there's all sorts of theories and you can go into Perestroika and all this sort of shit, but like there, there, there was lack of resources in both, you know? Um, but I doubt if the Mayans were still around, they'd say, oh, we ran out of water and food. That's why. That caused social unrest and there was scarcity of a born to be quality, a need for food. And right now we have a scarcity of emotion and empathy and connection and people not feeling a part of. And so in that, the value of choice, this man-made thing is so important that I wasn't exercising that if I'm in a reactive mode because right. my kid's not talking to me. So okay. now I got to force, now yeah. I got to control, now I got to stimulate, now I got to do things. And as a parent, you do have to stimulate, you do have to, sometimes you do have to force, that's your job mm -hmm. as a parent. But to get that expression, the thing that I wanted from them, I had to wait a couple of years. I had to do more things with them. One of the right. first things with them was we started doing fighting stuff in me. 
punch me in the face as hard as he could. And I never saw him smile <laughs> the way he <laughs> smiled. Then. And now there's a whole bunch of things that make me smile. He just decked me. And I was like, Jesus, like my eye was closed up. And he's like, ah, I'm like, okay, yeah, you are my kid. But, but anyway, the, <laughs> the thing is, is that we have to allow that expression to happen. Yes. So the people giving me advice in my group, they get, did give me good advice that was helpful, but it kept me from reacting and buying into the scarcity. Empathy is, a, is the allowing the other the space for self-expression. Mm-hmm. And I think that the act of self-expression itself, you know, it solves so much thing or prevents from, uh, us from doing really bad things. And it's weird because empathy can be seen in nature, but it is not valued in nature. It's not seen as something that, that mm-hmm. nature would be dependent upon. Like right. We, we mammals have that. Mm-hmm. You know, but- I'm, I'm still interested. Like if, you said you talk about addictions, you talk about divorce, you talk about your group, which is in a way is a little bit preventive as or as we're going through it, but it seems more like a a after thing, a cure almost, or a remedy in a way. But in, in the beginning of the talk you spoke also about and we touched upon it later a little bit, about helping young guys twenty to thirty, mm-hmm. like preparing them in a way. To go. So what I hear from young guys is uh, why be in a relationship that's uh-huh. pointless? Or even like when I was, I was in a, a lot of pain. And not to say, like, usually that thing with me is like, I mean, when it comes to seduction, I can, so I can coach somebody else. I get it. But when it comes to coaching myself, I can be lost. And especially when going through a divorce, you can be really confused. And there's a lot of things confusing to myself in that journey. In fact, I would even argue that seduction is supposed to make you confused Mm -hmm. because it's bigger than you. You could never be better than it. You might be a little bit more aware and comfortable, but like it's a crazy thing. So you could say that uh, before you were a lot more lost, but you're still lost. Yes. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So in the, the whole experience, I hear younger men say things like, What's the point right. in a relationship? In fact, when Michael, Michael Sky saw me when I was like in, the, in a lot of pain from my split up, and he came to my meetup, and there were all other guys talking about them. He's like, man, there's just so much pain. These guys need to get out of the US. And I was like, dude, it, it, yeah, I mean, I get that. Like, I think they should get out of the US and experience the rest of the world. But there's nothing, there's a great honor. There's a tremendous honor. There's something which is so amazing about having a family and committing your life to mm-hmm. something, whether or not it works out. There's something so profound. Yes. And then the only people that we hear about that are these like bizarros. You never hear like a, uh, a cool dude. Not that I am talking. You never hear like <laughs> you hear somebody that's like all Still nobody. Religious. Still no cool dude. Yeah, you hear like, uh, <laughs> yeah, man, you hear like these bizarre people talking about like, we need to have family values. It's like, man, I'm over right wing radio. And, you know, or whatever, like we see people talk about that in a way that I never related to, you know, um, and, and I would say also what's unique about me and maybe not so much my group and whether or not this means anything is that I have lived a sexual life that very few people on this earth could ever compete with, you know, anything that I've wanted in terms of sex and relationships, I've done till I'm exhausted. That's one of the reasons why I was like ready to be in a relationship. And mm-hmm. in. So my goal in this single life that I have is not to go out and conquest because I've done it. And so I very well get the result of living with anything that you would want sexually, with right. any relationship. And um, this is one thing that I have never gotten about. Go ahead. Yeah, I, this this really interests me. And I'm, I'm going to be very careful not to say anything because I want to know what you're thinking when you say when you speak about when you speak about this like guys say ah why would I go in a relationship if this is pointless you speak about family what what is it what is it there that you're speaking about are you speaking about commitment are you speaking about the lifestyle of say wife and children are you are you speaking about providing are you speaking about carrying a burden for others what what is it so first off Men who feel lost or don't know what it's like to be a man, they need to find out what that is. And that doesn't mean they need to start a family. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when I was 34 and 35, 
that was a good idea after I had gone and fucked the world. I mean, like I went up like, man, I, it was just crazy. I was even telling somebody about it now, but I mean, I we trust you. I want to hear about the family. <laughs> so it, it's like a lot of men walk into family because they think they're supposed to. Mm. And I never had any of that. Yet I also had the opposite of what family represented. Right. Like I had girlfriends everywhere. So I had a girlfriend that was my long-term girlfriend in the Caribbean for ever, for five years. I had a girlfriend in Paris. I had a girlfriend in Budapest. I had a girlfriend in Vienna. I had a girlfriend in, in uh, Rio de Janeiro. I had, like I had, and then girlfriends in Texas. I, and like I would live with two, I would live with two girls in Dallas at the same time. You know, it was like, what? And so it's just so funny because when I hear people talk about power and control over women, like, dude, really? Have you done it? Like the like people that I see doing that, there's like two. You know, there's not mm. there's not many. And this whole industry, but it's everybody's goal. And, and man, when, I, when people talked about that, I went for it. I just didn't realize most people weren't. And there were things that were fulfilling and unfulfilling. And so when I got to the point where I was like over it, another thing that I see in this industry with instructors is they don't think they can have a relationship. Non-issue with me at this point. Because when I met uh, my ex, I didn't think I could have a relationship. I was like, man, this can't happen. What, a, what an amazing gift. There's all sorts of things that mm. we got mad at each other about, still mad at each other about, but this was unreal because even uh, back to my, not being able to see my older kids for five years, that's when I nurtured my relationship with her. Almost like when that was all happening, she was new in the picture and she came to like the court dates and all this stuff with me. And um, you know what, which also gives you a, a, a insight to women because it ended up that there was a lot of value about, um, you know, independence and empowerment that were towards the end of our relationship, which may have been the cause. But in that, when she met me, didn't have a lot, was in a freaking massive court case that was just like totally screwed up, emotionally taxing, um, had a ton of instability in my life. I didn't even have a working car at the time. Like it was like all great seducers don't have cars <laughs> at some point you don't have to not have a car but at some point there's something just so in like, that case i've always been a great yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> or, 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 you were made for this job so but um the which and what i mean by that is like you should be able to seduce with nothing and you should be able to seduce mm -hmm. with everything and if you can't do either of those you're a failure you should get success in general when you have nothing when you have everything and if you have to have everything then you're selling yourself a lie and if you have to have nothing, then you're relying upon desperation and all this other shit. And so when it came time to have a family, I was ready. But, and, and I already had one, but it didn't mean the same thing at the time to me. I didn't understand. I didn't under, I had loss. It was, it was, I always tell my kids, it's the most pain. They've seen, my kids have seen me in a lot of pain. I said, the most pain, though, was with you guys. It was like the most, hands down. And, um, and when it, but when it came time to value that family, I'm not saying a 23 year old or another 35 year old. I'm saying for me in that time, it was very valuable. Mm -hmm. And at some point in your lives, you shouldn't deny it by saying like, Oh, there's you know, you get divorced. Dude, for me, it was so valuable because one, I was like, wow, I love this woman to the point where I will change everything for her. What an amazing thing. Right. And, and that when people say like, this is a misinterpretation of so much of the manosphere dialogue and even in pickup is that you should always be ready to dedicate your life to, to something and, and women are a part of that if you're a heterosexual male that's a beautiful thing yes to seek to be seduced you know rather than to just seduce what do you like I, what do you tell the guys that 20 year old guy who who think oh, i shouldn't get into a relationship it's meaningless what do you tell besides this story that you just tell? Do you teach them things? Do you? Well, if people are saying, well, first off, there's a bit of advice before I teach. I teach a lot, but if you want that, I'll teach you how to get that. But if you're unwilling to get that, then I can't teach you. So what I would first say is that go and get it. All right, go. motherfucker, you want to fuck tens? Go fuck tens. Don't talk to me about whatever. Oh, I can't approach her. She's a six or whatever, which is like 
if anybody's saying that about women, they don't understand the beauty mm. that women can hold, that uh, sex or something you're not attracted to could turn you on to so much. And I get it. We, we have draws towards things. That's good to have. But if you want something, wait, I, well, I want to be successful. I want to make a million dollars. Okay, let's start. Let's do what's necessary to make a million bucks right. from where you're at right now. But you're not willing to do it. If you're not willing to do that, then you're going to waste my time because it's a belief and an insecurity that's making you want to do it and not an action wanting to do things. Right. And everybody's listening. Oh, okay, I can do it. Or like my friend that's a porn star, he's like, you have to do this. And so then people will email him like, well, I'll do that. I'll do that. But then this gets to a bigger thing. If you really want success, if you really want to have the best sex of your life, you really want to have the best you or you're afraid of relationships and you just want to fuck the world or whatever, then let's do that okay, you can't do that. Let's look at why you can't do it. Because why you can't do it isn't just a lack of dedication or pushing your comfort zone or whatever. There's a reason why you're not valuing that, which gets into the real you. And you have to study that right. if you're going to be naked in front of a woman and give yourself to her. Otherwise, you're going to end up like a lot of the pickup guys I know who just fucked and didn't know why they were. Why, why do I want all these women? Because mm -hmm. they never looked at themselves. You, you know, what a terrible thing it would be like so i got out of a relationship where both my wife and i gave our lives for and it didn't work but there's a point long periods where there's no doubt both of us gave our entire lives for and a lot of that we were sunk we were in sync but we gave our entire lives for mm. but we may have had personal problems that got in the way of that and now that we're split it's my job to look at that for myself. It's her job mm -hmm. to do whatever route she wants to do to determine that. But for me, if I'm ever going to do that, so I'm ready always to give myself to something that I care about. Mm -hmm. But one, it would take a lot to impress me on that level in terms of a woman. And two, it would also require me to be at my best self. And you never know what it's going to come. So you should always be working towards that mm -hmm. so i may sit there and have my pain going like oh i want a woman to do this and that for me or i want more sex steve go out and get it go out and do it right but you do it because that's going to expose why you're not right this is the reason why you don't have it you want a million bucks why don't you have it well it's hard i, mean, I wasn't born there. no no try try because you you definitely can in this world I get it, you know, 0.1% can do or whatever it is, but like you can do it. You can. So why are you not? Why are you, which what you can change within you, not, not your skin color or right. any of this other stuff, which I get is a factor. I'm not denying that, but dude. Taking full yeah, hundred percent responsibility for the success yeah. in your life. Yeah. So that would be the first thing I'd say. The more gentle way is, is like, look, you're going to change, man. When you're 23, <laughs> you're 25, you're 26. Right. You can think that all you want. I thought like if you asked me when I was when I was eight years old, I think my friend, he was like, why would people smoke cigarettes? It's, you're inhaling smoke. You know, or why would somebody be a drug addict? And man, I've, you know, been in a corner, you know, like crushing up Percocets to shoot them in my <laughs> arm or my neck. You know I mean? It's like, it's you, why would you do that? Because it's the best choice of the moment. Like you don't understand why I would do that, then don't talk to me. Mm -hmm. You know, so you you need to be able to to get that people aren't stupid. You know, this even ties into the feminism thing. It's like, well, women are so stupid because they don't do whatever. And then the locker room talk will be like, Jesus Christ, God, man, I can't believe they're like they're they're feeling off, and their best option is the yes. action that they're taking now, which is usually out of scarcity and out of fear and how do we solve that and maybe for the short term the answer is to solve it hard maybe the answer is to solve it with power you know maybe it's to solve it through compassion but you have to be wise enough see nobody wants to be the man that is wise enough to take both to, yes not one side of the understand thing. everything yes. and make actions from that everybody yes. wants to be the man because everybody wants the man with the answer why because there's a man that that knows what it's like to not have an answer and be embarrassed by it to be belittled by it, to feel like they're worthless. Mm. And we get back into that problem of everybody feeling so fucking worthless to the point where we have our fears guiding right. our solution. It's another philosophical thing. <laughs> pain shows you where the problem is, but it will never show you the answer. Yes. I, 
like speaking, tying in what you just said like 30 seconds ago, what do you feel that over the year or what do you see over the years, what capabilities, skills did you develop that you say these are, <laughs> he's taking a picture, what are the capabilities that you've developed that you say, ah, oh, those are, are great assets for someone that I want to, that I, I can help someone with this. You know, what are you, according to you, and I have a couple of things in mind with the work I've seen you do, but what are, according to you, your capabilities that you developed, that you're in a, in a, in a position to help, to help a guy, to help a guy with addictions, to help a guy with mm -hmm. going through divorce, to help that young guy who's 20, 30 and says, ah, it's meaningless, but I do, I want something else. What are yeah. your skills? Man, I was going to answer that, but then you switched it at the end. It fucked me up. So, <laughs> the, uh, the, I mean, look, man, life experience would be a, right. like an idea of, you know, compassion. So I, I'm not the guy that gets it right. I'm the guy that tries too fucking much in, mm -hmm. in a stupid way. I mean, man, I... I, to get clean as a junkie doesn't mean that you had some awareness. It means that you forced yourself into desperation to the point where you had to change. And that's not like, it's actually crazy because I've, I've been looking at all this PTSD stuff that I have. It's not the beating. It's not the getting raped. It's not the being robbed. It's not the junkie shit that happens. It's the feeling alone and awkward and isolated from the world because of that, which is what everybody feels. It's so weird. I'm like going through like, man, I think these specifics of these really like horrific events in my life would be important, but they're actually not coming up in the uh, PTSD stuff that I've been looking at. PTSD stuff? is Post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. So, so like a lot of people, like, so I work with people that have that and man, it's like, you hear some of their stories. It's like, Jesus, like uh, your, your life partner kills themselves in front of you and Twice, I know somebody that happened twice. But that, and you might be going like, what problems do they have? They're a drug addict, that's the problem. Like in the drug mm -hmm. world, crazy shit happened. Like just crazy, man, crazy. Like fucking horrific things. So, but anyway, so in that, I thought that, that uh, those specifics would really come up. And right now they're not of the, the, uh, the different problems I've experienced, which is what I usually answered to and at one point they did you know, really not like, you know what's that like to sit and you know take having the shit beat out of you and it doesn't stop and you're going in and out of consciousness still having the shit beat out of you wanting to stop thinking you're going to die for extended periods of time of giving up of not being able to fight back and giving up and accepting death but it's not coming that, like, that's not an easy thing to do and then being uh, let's say like in a situation where you're homeless and you 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 know you're bleeding, so it's even worse. You're going to die of an infection. You're going to and you know this as you're getting beaten, and you can't see and you know you're, you're thinking as you're getting the shit kicked out of you. Your liver is making you, you know, vomit because you get got kicked in it or got a liver knockout. That in that you're thinking and you have hepatitis C already. And you're just thinking like, man. This is bad, but the, the week that I'm about to endure, I'm going to die and it's cold. And I'm, and my wounds are, I'm going to be swollen. And, and sometimes if you get beaten really bad and, and you swell up and it's really cold and you can't tend to them, a lot of times they'll burst and then those wounds will burst and you get infections from that. Or if somebody has diabetes, and that's great. there's all sorts of fucked up things that most people don't think about. <laughs> so you're saying you, you one of your greatest capability skills is the fact that you've been there you've had that experience oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so you can yeah. share that you can you can yeah. come from that place yeah. i seen another great in the, the, the when i met the group i thought that's a great capability you you've developed that for your own but it's but it's it's there and it's a great resource for guys yeah so let me tell you about a resource some dude had ptsd and he was like man i'm just smiling i was like i was like dude man I'm uh, like, okay, so, and I'm like laughing and telling like this. I'm like, man, so you want to like kill or beat the shit out of people? I'm like, dude, let me ask you, do you know what it's like to beat the shit out of somebody and have them switch to that point where they beg, they beg for mercy. They beg one for you to stop. They'll tell you anything. They'll be anything. And they just beg for their life and they're crying and you're just like laughing. Like you like it. And he, he starts crying. He's like, why are you saying this? Why? This isn't cool. Like, 
this isn't fun. I'm like, no, man, no, like, chill out, chill out for a second. I get it, it's wrong. But like, but you felt that, like there's a part of you that, that liked that. And he's like, why are you saying this? And he's like really upset with me. And I'm like, hold on, hold on, man, hold on, cowboy. Like, like you gotta, you gotta realize like, if you felt that and you're trying to hide that from people, you're trying to hide, you're putting an image that's fake in front of the world. Right. Of the guy that's going, oh, I didn't have this happen. I didn't have this happen. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's, no, I'm a good person. I'm, a good I'm person. only good. And um, I never do that. Like, I have stuff I don't want to talk about. It's a weird thing because therapy and psychology has only been around a short time, say like 150 years. And then addiction on the How is it? How is what you just said, how, however interesting it is? How was, uh, you, you, were, you start talking about a resource. How is that a resource? Or it's just, a, are you referring to the knowledge, the deep knowledge of experience that you had? And yeah, well, you can help a guy. I talked about yes. it. And I sit around with my friends. Gotcha. So people who don't understand the drug world, I refrain from that conversation. From right. But around other addicts, it's like, hmm. it's great. Like I, like I was talking about the, <laughs> so I don't know how many people I've known who died, but there's a lot. I was with this chick who uh, I was with a lot when uh, I was initially going through my the breakup situation and she's an addict and like we would talk about stuff and just the stories that she had were just so nuts, but it was funny to us, right? The things that don't emotionally haunt us or maybe they do a little bit, right? but it's like, it's like, Jesus Christ, you did what? You fucking, you know, had a, you got busted by the cops and put the heroin in your bra and then in the cop car you were able to contort your body enough to get it out of your bra and shove up your ass and spent three nights in jail. <laughs> it was so cold where you had to sit around prostitutes and like, and, and stay close for warmth. And then as soon as you, you, you and then for three days, you don't shit cause you're on heroin and you haven't gotten sick yet. And then you shit it out. <laughs> the first thing you do is you go to work and you, or you don't go to work. You go to CVS and get some needles and you had the experience and more. Yeah, so I didn't necessarily experience that, but it's like, yes, dude, I get the desperation. I get the lack of priorities. I get the soul. Yes. Oh, that's like so crazy. That's awesome. I'll, I'll add something that I saw in you that I think is one of your greatest capabilities. Mm. And, uh, and I have a question for you, too. Uh, maybe the final question. Um, I, what I saw when I saw the group and the way you talk with them, well, first of all, you're a great leader. You're a great leader. Um, I don't think so. I don't lead at all. So, but yeah. yeah, a really good good leadership in the group, and uh, but and mainly because of of this capability that I saw so clearly is that you have an incredible care for the guys. Mm-hmm. You really, really care for each one of them. I saw it, and uh, and I think that's a great, great capability, and it's 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 healing for a lot of guys. You know, to know that someone is there, fucking cares. You know, and so. My question then, I, my question to you is, where do you think that comes from for yourself? Where does that care for the, the, other, the other guys come from? Let's bring it back to family values. <laughs> Right-wing radio, conservative, <laughs> MAGA. I don't know. I don't, all right, whatever. So, like, have you always, like, I'll tell you this. My, my care is, is one that only came later. I've always been an artist. I'm, I'm yeah. describing, and, and, and at best a teacher, which is, this is what I know and do whatever you want with it, you know? Mm-hmm. And I've, I've come with the years as I feel a, a more of a connectedness, I feel a strong urge to help and I feel a, 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 a very strong care and love, you know? But that's me, you know? Mm-hmm. You obviously had it, uh, or I don't know, you had it earlier or you, what, so there's know? always this like origin story that we have, which is usually bullshit. It's like how we like to see ourselves. Like literally, I think right. psychologically, right? right. There's usually a very different road that made this all work. But anyway, so uh, you know, back to this whole family values thing and like all the PUA bullshit is like those those assholes like always would say this. They'd always say this, and you'd always get this in the drug world too. Like you're using dope with buddies, and you're like 16. You're like, man, I don't have a family. You're my family. And so like a lot of coaches right. in seduction would be like, no, man, I don't, I don't, I value this friendship more because I didn't have a mom and a dad that I could trust. And I was like, yeah, cool. It spoke to me a lot. And then I realized probably by the time I was like already in the whole pickup world, that that was bullshit. That meant mm-hmm. you were a bad person. That meant that you were fucked up. 
and you would fuck me over if, like, if you had the chance. And that's true that I saw in the pickup world. But in the drug world, again, it's like a hyper experience where you learn for me slowly that that's not true. Like you have buddies, but man, when shit comes, like you don't have shit. And like, and then there's other people like where you may not be friends. You go through this traumatic. This is a big PTSD thing. You go through a very traumatic experience, and you only relate to them, even though you're not friends. But you see them like family because you can't articulate whatever you've been through. Like I never went to war, and like if I work with vets who have PTSD, it's a little bit different than drug people. But anyway, so. But it's that same phenomenon, like the experiences. I never liked you, but in full, we picked up our friend's, you know, <laughs> nose and tried to put it to the nose, the wrong body, that we put the wrong part on. Anyway, so the when it came to the uh, when it came to having a family, that was one of the greatest things that I learned from my ex. Was so great is that family never leaves. Family never leaves. Uh-huh. And so we we decided to split, but family can never leave. And then you saw examples of that uh, in her culture and how she lived to a certain extent because of those like divorces that happen and then they get all pissed off. But family, that was very important. And then as I cleaned up a lot of the stuff in my life, even before I met her, which made it possible for me to meet her, was that I saw that in my own family. It's like, holy shit. My parents actually disowned me twice in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean like a, Junkie, that's what happens. You know, this is the best thing you can do for a junkie a lot of times is just cut them out. But um, the you know they never left. You know, so they never left. Like there were things that I needed to change, even if they disowned you. So to see that sort of compassion is like, I could sit there and tell my groups and form a cult and say that I'm their family, but I'm not. I always said I'm not. I'm not that guy who's always going to be there. But what you need now, I will be here. Uh-huh. But when you build your life, the right people are going to be around you will never leave. And uh, that's what you're looking for. And really, that's, this is another, it's one of those things. It's like, why do we want all this independence? It's, it's to bring up the word nature, it's against our nature. Right. A be, uh, independence. But, but I, yes, but I'm very interested in that. Like you see, is it, are you telling me you see these experiences of like your family Uh, will never leave you and and therefore you feel this deep care for these guys yeah because i know how what it feels like to feel like you don't have a family uh-huh. i know what it like dude i ran away from home when i was 15 and i just went and saw my family my family that i stayed with uh-huh. my wife and that's why i'm wearing the maui shirt <laughs> it's like this chick who made this shirt is this artist and i was like holy shit and uh, she happens to live in the town where my grandmother's born and now my fake family, my Hawaiian family lives. Because when I was 15, I ran away and lived with them. I Where were you living? In California. And you, well, you got to swim to Colorado. In Irvine. Yeah, no, so uh, <laughs> uh, there was this lady that had six kids and they became, they're my cousins basically. And they, and I stayed with them. In yeah. Irvine? Yeah, yeah. It's so funny because she was a single mom and I remember when I was having problems with my first two kids, she was like, nope, Steve, this sounds off. You should leave. What? Is there a single mom? Like I would expect, you know, this is like 15 years You would years say ago. stay. Yeah, and she was like, no, no, this is this sounds really bad. Like you need to get out and you need to let the kids know you love them and then leave and get out. And then when I went to jail, she was like, see, are you going to listen to me now? Are you going to listen? And um, so she was very supportive. And it's weird because I don't talk, I call her my second mom, but I don't talk to her that much. I talk to my real mom right now. But for a long period of time, I didn't talk to my real mom. So I needed right. somebody that, that was there. I just saw my cousin, Mele, and I was like, I just remember Mele, I was like, I never knew what this was like. Mm. I was 28 or 27 or whatever. I'm like, man, this and that happened. No, I was 28. And um, I'm like, this and that happened. She's like, fuck them. Like, let's go fuck them up. I'm like, no, you are like, you stay with me. Like she was so, she was like, your family. I never had anybody like that. So to have somebody there, it was so cool. And we didn't go fucking anybody. But, To have somebody who had your back in that way, right. you know, that, that was so special because I never, I didn't feel that. But at the same time, I was blind to it because my parents did so many things for me. So how can I do that? And man, like my kids now, it's like, I, they, they, they'll call me or they'll text me when I'm here and I'll talk to them. And like one of my kids, he's, he's going through some problems and I'm like, yeah, right, man, you want to stay at my place? What do you want to do? Like, Dad, I want to ask you this for... The kid who was not paying attention to me as much now is like, will ask me for certain advice and so right. on. And, 
and really, but, but the availability to be there. Yes. And I, you know, one of the guys in my group, he told me this and I was like, dude, I can't live up to this. I cannot, this is crazy. He's like, one thing I'll say, motherfucker, is if my kids are in front of me, I may give them the wrong decision, I may do the wrong thing, but I will always deliver my best. I will always be my best. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. He's like, let me tell you something. I fuck up. I don't do, but I always want to do my best. That kind of dedication, that, that kind of hearing, hearing from other people that slowly influences you, yeah. that in the time when you're, you're under duress and you're like, oh my God, you know, whatever, you might not be able to listen to it, but then you can relax a little, you can be there. The, the opportunities are going to come in life, right. whether it's kids or whether it's relationships, whether it's whatever, you know. But you have to allow the choice, back to the choice, the beautiful man-made concept. A choice, but leverage nature. The best way for men and women to get together is to be alone, because nature will make that happen. Right. But the human quality of choice of what makes it special, what gives meaning to seduction, does not come from control. Does not come from power. Power can be found within it. It can be there, man. You know, all this crazy shit can be there, and it can be serving in whatever way. But if choice does not mm. exist, it, it falls. Wow. Well, that's that's very inspiring to me see also I'm, I'm i'm very happy that i get to know you a little bit better uh -huh. i see the power in it uh, power no really the yeah the strength the strength of what you're standing for um but i would like to give you before we give some details i would like to give you an opportunity or the last word is this something you would like to say to a, a guy or a woman or whoever out there and that you say I got a message for, for that person. Or, uh, There's a lot of things I could say. Right. Number one, don't leave the house without a $5 bill. <laughs> no, um, no, man, like one. So this is advice that was kind of given to me secondhand, but do what you love and quit it before it kills you. Don't, <laughs> don't have shame. And that goes to, I did that with sex. I did that with drugs. I did that with a lot of It's things. a nice adaptation to, uh, it's Bukowski, no? I don't know, did he? He says, find what you love and let it kill you. Well, yeah, do what you love and quit it before it kills you. Man. <laughs> like, I like, like that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with sex, but I could make it really fucking bad. I could <laughs> drop that shit into the fucking ground. I could find the hell in me and have it touch your life. You know, it's like, because it's something that powerful that you're not humble about. If you're not humble, you'll be humiliated. You know? So the, but, there's that, and then also like you can live through anything. Like, man, I, this is what I, people have the option and ability to be a pussy, and I can be a pussy right there with you, but like we do it too much. And I guess what I mean by that is that like, I see people go through so much pain and they end up good. They may not have a full set of teeth, they may have, <laughs> track marks all over their body. They may, they may have a lot of problems. They may have like devastating emotions. They may not be able to have a relationship. Mm -hmm. That's a real common thing. I know people that cannot have a relationship. Um, you know, like you're prostituting, you've been a male prostitute, whatever. You, you've had like things which make it very difficult, but that does not mean you can't be spiritual. In fact, I was writing about this when we were at the cafe, cafe earlier, is that at any point in your life, you can find the good in you, which I will call spirituality, but I don't mean that in terms of religion or what you may hate. I mean that in terms of the essence of humanity, of what makes it good. If you rob somebody, if you did something really bad, really bad, I don't care what it is, a human thing, but I know people that have done really bad things and I've done really bad things. At that moment, you can still be spiritual. You can still find your way. That doesn't mean that you don't have to be responsible for it that you can find the good. Mm -hmm. And then no matter where, if you've had bad things done to you, the worst thing has happened. See, the beautiful thing about our born to be qualities, it means our qualities of nature. So a quality of man would be like laws or rules, which are great. The inspiration for laws and rules are a quality of nature. The qualities of nature, being healthy, mm -hmm. right? Like if you eat shitty food, you're gonna get sick, right? But if you eat good food, if I don't eat it, presto. Yeah, I was thinking it and you are saying I know, it. man. I was like, I'm going to be vegan. And then <laughs> that I, is after we came from Salud Pan. Salud Pan is, yeah, but that was good. I felt good. 
And but, so you had to like fuck it up by going to well, press no, it? I needed to use the internet to contact <laughs> you because you weren't waiting up for me at 2.30 like you said in your account. No, I don't know. No. So yeah, I could have gone to many places, but I went to Presto and I ordered fries. Which I was like, okay, I can eat some fries <laughs> and I can drink this iced tea. Which it doesn't have, it has some sugar, but it's not like American. American iced tea is so fucked up. I'm like, all right, whatever, I'll, I'll drink this. But, but, um, but then the mayo, they have the mayo dip. So I could have been vegan up until the mayo dip. <laughs> anyway, so I went, I went there and um, uh, if you, basically if you eat good food, your body will naturally correct yourself. So all born to be qualities are naturally connected corrected for us being in born to be situations. This is my ultimate philosophy for coaching. Say that again. Our born to be qualities can get fulfilled, get empowered, whatever you want to call them. If we're put in situations that were our, our nature, our born to be nature. Okay. So it's like all the, all the angry, like all pick up is like, hey, let me tell you about evolutionary psychology. Cherry picked to work for our society to gain power always for men and never for women. You know, it's like just, it's so ridiculous. It's right. like, here's how the nature of man is that we assume that we don't really know that this is it. And then we see it by the nature of women who act this way in society, the same society that we're gaining our power attributes from or whatever, so that you can have some fucking, so Jordan Peterson is the model of alphaness, which is like, come on, dude. Like, and he says good things, but like, he's not like, like he, like guys are looking for, he's like the voice of the nerdy dude who never got laid. You know, it's like finally somebody I can relate with that probably, you know, has low T and, you know, has, you know, can't really do much other than, you know, work at Harvard, which is a tremendous accomplishment, but they're empowering these nerdy dudes to go be like Tim Kennedy, who I trained with in Austin, who says a lot of things that Jordan Peterson, that I disagree with a lot of things Tim says, but that dude is like, nobody, nobody is, this is the crazy thing. Tim Kennedy, you trained with him. And then Kelvin Gastelum, who beat Tim Kennedy and knocked him out, you trained with him. You could feel like a dominant dude in some aspects of your life training with Kelvin, who knocked out Tim. Tim, no. Tim is the, like, he's like, you don't fuck with that motherfucker. But the thing is, is that um, a born-to-be quality, when we get to those, and this is what I really teach from, because you have to know your nature, right? Sex, socializing, mm. health, mm. emotional health, health and well-being. You know, these are all things that nature cared. Just we evolved towards it. And the other thing about evolution is a lot of people mix this up. Well, they don't mix up this theory, but they this is part of the cherry picking. Evolution doesn't mean that we were designed. It's the opposite of that. It's that there were random mistakes that still could be mistakes. A fly is more evolved than us. It is more. It has evolved longer than us. It is more superior in the theory of whatever evolution of things just falling than we are. But we often think that we evolved this way. So that means it was an absolute and it's the right thing. Right. So it's a mistake that worked. Evolution just means that if I have like an extra thumb, it doesn't get in the way of me dying. So our ways of uh, a rat, you know, may or may not be more evolved than us, you know? So it, any lizard, any, aquatic animal you know unless it evolved that well whatever anyway but most are more evolved than us they've been in the mix longer than us and that doesn't mean that they have an advantage of us with a lot of the things that we value and so we take ideas like evolution and we go like oh well men did this and women did that and we hunted dude we don't know shit this is a mistake there's a series of mistakes that happened for us to, it, what I see is for us to unify and come together mm -hmm. because we could not live isolated and and, uh, and we're doing that with all our hate groups. Yes. Like with all of our we're getting there. opinions, <laughs> we're able to communicate. But we need to realize that the main reason is not the power, is not the white supremacy, is not the social movement. It's right. the ability for something, uh, an opportunity for us to connect. And that's what is so drawing and attractive to us. So why don't you do that to somebody that you don't know across the street in front of you? Exactly. Say hello. Get to know them. And... Great. I'm saying this, but I don't always want to talk to everybody. But oh, you're very sociable. Well, yeah, but sometimes I want to be alone. But of the, course. But there's always like, like if I'm doing that, I'm going like, okay, there's something wrong with me, you know, that needs to to figure out where I can get back out and see people. Mm. Well, I'm very happy to get a clearer or more detailed picture of 
how you're functioning and your work. Mm-hmm. Where, where a guy who's listening and feels that it resonates with the whole thing or part of the message, where and he wants to know more about your work beyond this podcast. Where, where we, where can I send them? If you go to Pornhub or X <laughs> <laughs> um, no, those are my preferred sites for, for connection, solitude, accompanying. Um, the the yes, yeah, so you can go to the sexuallife.com. That's been my website for years. And then there's also Austin. And sexuallife.com. The, the yeah. sexuallife.com. It will be in the notes underneath this uh, podcast. Yeah. Sexuallife.com and what else? But the best places would be if you go on Facebook to the Austin Men's Development Group or if you find me on social media. YouTube. Austin Men's Development Group is an open group, which means you can find it and then you have to apply, right? So I think it's a private group. But yes, yes if you're in there, people can search your name and see that you're in it. Yes. Um, but let me just tell you from my court case none of that stuff like dude be careful what you put on social media people because yes everything can be found so even though it's a it's a there are secret groups that we have in facebook if under court order and somebody wants to pay their attorney that much to read mountains of shit which is like very very expensive that can all be subpoenaed but a, a secret group is different than a private group on facebook private group people can still see that you're a part of that group but they cannot see what you're writing in the group unless they're in And then a secret so group. So people can them. apply for that. People yeah. can apply for that. And that's really what I would Austin recommend. Men's Development. So it's Austin called. Men's Development. Austin Men's Development. There's also a website for that, but it's kind of just floating inside. So you can see one day. And uh, a way to contact you personally? Yeah, email. Um, smoke signals are good. <laughs> and then uh, uh, people have even put a like a message in a bottle, but they've written a note and a DNA code on an STD and then sometime how it gets back to me. But, um, or the, email? Email is steve at the sexuallife.com. Sexuallife.com. Boom. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. And I really, I, I, I'm, I'm happy we started off with you because I really want to honor you for the work that you do. I'm very inspired and I feel like I have to be at my best when yeah. I see what you're doing. The stand you make for, for men, you know, for men like you and then gone through or going through experiences you've gone through and uh yeah i feel very supportive to see men like you out there and also yeah inspired and, and spurred on so thank you very much Woo, later you're too far to catch the morning For your betrayal, I see you dancing, hopping on that last train. And what a sight now, darling, with all those things that we may feel.